Hi everybody, it's Sarah Cray and I teach watercolor and today we are doing our Misty Treetops project. Oh wow. Thank you, we have Michael here working the cameras. Hello. And you might have noticed that Keenan hasn't been in the last few tutorials. He actually has been transferred to our sister company, Missouri Star Quilt Company. And so I just wanted to say a quick moment of gratitude to Keenan for all the work that he put in and the brightness that he brought to the tutorials. He will be missed. Um, and even though change is hard, I'm also glad that we have someone here that you guys are a little bit more familiar with. Um, so it's not like starting over. You know what I mean? Talking about me. I am. Okay. And, um, okay, so let's get into our project. We are going to be doing this in five steps. I'm going right. to check my steps. Right. Okay, so our very first step here is we are going to stretch our paper, which means we wet both sides and put in our first layer of wash. Our second step is we are going to put in a light value around our trees. Our third step is we're going to put in our medium value. Our fourth step another medium value, our fifth step, um, our dark values. So basically the whole point of this project is we are going to build up the layers on wet paper and build up the values. And that is what is gonna give us this feeling of like misty rain and like wetness. And um, I'm really excited for this project. I've never taught anything like this before. It's a new technique, so I'm really excited to dive in. We are using four paintbrushes for this project. We have a round two, round six, round 12, and one inch wash. Please know that you can use whatever brushes that you have and you don't have to have these exact ones in order to do this project. We are using two paint colors. We have black and azure blue. Um, also know that you can just use one paint color if you want. This is what we call a monochromatic painting, which is, it's essentially just one color. And we're gonna be mixing these two colors to make one. Okay. Sweet. Um, blah, 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 blah. I'm not taping my paper down because we are doing um, wetting it. But what I do have, which sometimes makes it helpful to do that kind of wash, is a spray bottle. So I'll be using a spray bottle to kind of wet my paper on both sides. I think that's everything. Okay. So I've already transferred my outline and we are going to do our oath and then we will get into painting. So if you can raise your right hand and repeat after me, I promise to be kind to myself. I promise to be kind to myself. I promise not to compare my work. I promise not to compare my work. And I promise to have fun. And I promise to have fun. Thank you so much. The bell was buried, I had to find it. You did good. Thank you. Okay, so the biggest thing I want you guys to know how I just wanna give you some insight before we start painting is when we wet our paper, we're essentially going to let the wetness of the paper diffuse the paint out and that's how we get this very smear, fuzzy, out of focus look. We really don't need our paper to be dry or mostly dry until the last two steps. So if you notice that your paper is starting to dry when we're on step two, go ahead and do another layer of water. Like it will not mess it up. Um, and if anything, I think the more smeariness and messiness um, actually lends itself to this project. So I don't want you to stress about stress out about it. Um, the other thing is we will not be using our, I mean, I'll try not to use our craft tool. So basically we're gonna wet our paper and then just keep adding layers as it naturally dries. So then when we're ready for that fifth step, then our paper should be dry. Does that make sense? Totally. So it is, this is gonna be a little bit longer because we're not, we're watching paint dry kind of thing, but we'll be painting the whole time and adding layers. Okay, I can tell I'm a little bit nervous because I'm putting off starting. Okay, so I'm gonna take my one inch wash to help me spread the paper. And as you can see, I'm using a drawing board on top of my surface because I'm gonna get paint everywhere so if you really care about the tabletop that you're painting on put something you can use your box that this project came in like put something underneath to paint on because these liquid watercolors will um stay surfaces if you're going for that look i mean i sometimes like that but okay here we go so i'm going to take my spray bottle just do a few sprays take my one inch and just kind of smear it and I'm going to do one more layer because, again, I want to make sure this stays nice and wet. You might say, can it get too wet? 
probably not for this project, honestly. I mean, this one, we really want it to be super wet. Okay. And you'll notice that as we kind of smear this water around, we can kind of like almost, the paper will almost suction cup to our surface. Now that might not always stay flat. I noticed when I was painting this project initially, like it kind of created a bump in the middle, just one little beep. So if that happens to you, know that that happened to me too and it might happen again. Sarah, this might be the silliest question. Could you just like dip this in the sink? Or is that too much water? No, you can totally dip it, dip it in the sink. I just don't have a sink handy. Okay, so you see how I'm starting to get a little bit of a bump here? I'm gonna just spray the back one time. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, stretching paper is like new to me. It's not something I do a lot, so there might be better ways. There might be rules that I've just, I mean, like I tried to do sufficient research, but I could be wrong. So just find a way that works for you. All right, so now that it is soaked, we want our painting to be soaked. I'm gonna grab my round 12 and I'm gonna mix a little bit of the Azure with a little bit of the black. And I want this really light, light color, like a barely there color. And then I'm just gonna start dropping it in. And you'll see that it's just gonna diffuse out. And if you want to like mix a lot, you can. You just got to be careful because if you put a lot of paint in there, you see how that's a darker value. You just want to make sure that we're working with a very light value. And as it diffuses out, see how much lighter it gets as it diffuses? Like you guys could probably barely see that. It really is a barely there color. Now, if you transferred your outline, you might have been slightly frustrated at the outline itself because it actually is just a lot of scribble marks. And that is because I'm like, how do I communicate that we literally are just dropping in color like this? Like we kind of are just scribbling. You see how it's just kind of like dot, 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 dot. You can do a swoosh if you want. I mean, honestly, how you put the color in right now, it's not gonna make a huge difference because no matter what, it's just gonna. My outline did not go all the way to the end of my paper because outlines are eight and a half by 11 and our paper is nine by 12. So I'm just gonna like extend the line of the edge of my outline, but if you want it to stop there, you can. Okay, so you see how it kind of lipped up a little bit? Let's see if I can press it down. All right, so we did our first step and now we're just gonna repeat that same exact thing. And this is where we're gonna start paying attention to where we get different values. So we do have some barely there colors. And then you see how the treetops and the leaves kind of build up in value. So we're still in the part where it's just a, a light value, okay? We're not at the medium values yet. So I still have a lot of water mixed into my um, color here. So basically, I'm just kind of going around the edge and then along the trees, kind of up into the trees. Okay. 
and our paper should be still really, really wet, that these colors are just diffusing out. And look at that, look how beautiful that is. If you notice that your marks are all becoming like the same, the same width, even apart, all of that kind of stuff, sometimes I'll just randomly smear just to kind of mess up that look. Because our brain likes to make patterns and it likes to look for patterns. And sometimes we will unconsciously create patterns when we put marks down on our paper. And then it becomes really easy for the viewer to see them, which can sometimes distract them from actually seeing the artwork. So then whenever I notice myself doing that, and I, I do that still now, like I've been painting for years, and my brain just automatically will create evenly spaced marks, um, I'll just smear. So really let yourself play with like different mark making. That might have been a little bit too dark of a value compared to the rest, but it's not um, going to ruin anything. It's not going to ruin anything. So if you accidentally go a little bit too dark, that's fine. As long as we have a light there in some places, it's going to be okay. Do you ever um, try to paint left-handed to remind yourself what it felt like to be a beginner? No, but that's a really fun idea. I taught guitar lessons uh, like in high school and you forget when you, you know, when you're practiced at something, you forget what it feels like. And so I would just like, if I would put a lesson together, I would try to play it left-handed, just flip the guitar over to see if I could because you, you feel like a beginner again. That's a great idea. It kind of just reminds you of what, how foreign things feel. Yeah. The, the lack of coordination that you have when yeah. you're just starting. Okay, so we put in our first two layers. Now we should have a very soft, fuzzy wash around the edge of our paper um, and like towards the middle. We do have a little bit of a light area right here where not a lot of paint went. That's okay, that's kind of what we want. Same thing in our reference photo here. And then this is where you're gonna kind of check the wetness of your paper still. And I might apply another layer especially underneath, like I feel the underneath my paper and it feels dry. So. And then I, I'm just gonna spray the front and if you're afraid of smearing, you're like, what if I just smear everything that I just put in? It's not gonna smear that much because it's such a light value and it's already like seeped into the paper like I'm doing this and it's barely doing anything okay so don't be afraid to like add another layer smear it around okay and now I'm gonna grab Mix a little bit more, so Azure and Black. I'm gonna try and match the color that was there before that's feeling a little bit too blue. So let's grab a little bit more from there. Good, and then I'm gonna add water to it to lighten it up. Okay. And then we're gonna do the same thing, kind of go around and put in, this is more like a light medium value. So as you do your values, there's like a light value, a, a medium light value, a medium value, a medium dark value, and a dark value. And then like so many in between, but we're like trying to like split the hairs a little bit of those values to really create the sense of like mistiness and fogginess and depth in this. So I'm gonna put it down, drop it in, and just kind of let the colors move around. So you see how it's just one click darker? Okay. 
Now when you look at your outline and when you look at the reference photo, this is a great practice in looking for values. So I want you, if you're feeling a little bit lost, I just want you to like take a breath and then look at where do you see the darkest darks and then work backwards from there. It's, it's easier for my eye to identify like the darkest parts of a painting. And so I'll look and I'll be like, okay, I'll half close my eyes, which lets in less light in your eyes, which makes it easier to determine values. Then I'm like, okay, those are the darkest areas. What's the next darkest? These. Okay, what's the next darkest? Okay, I see some in between. So just kind of like work that way to try and see those different values. And then just kind of start to put them in. But the beautiful thing is like we're using our round 12 for this, which means we're lifting up our brush. And when you lift up your brush, it allows there to be light in between. We're not taking a one inch wash and just like doing an even medium wash across it. I want there to be sections where you see a light value, a medium, a medium light value in between the darks. And if you want to use the tip on some of these, that's just fine. You see how that's kind of staying a little bit more. We can even go back. I'm kind of working clockwise, but you can go back and forth in between. I love this painting because it's one of those where it automatically takes you to a place. You look at it and it's such a, such a mood, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> where you're just like, I know what it is to stand in, uh, like go hiking early in the morning or, you know, whatever. And you feel the dew, you can feel the moisture in the air. You can feel the mistiness in the fog. And I love... I love it when you can look at a painting and it automatically brings up such strong memories or imagery. You know what I mean? Like, I think as the youth would say, it's a vibe. It's a vibe. <laughs> it is a vibe. What does okay. this one remind you of specifically? Where? Uh, well, I think of the Northern Pacific Coast. What about you? I mean, it's too blue. I... Northern Pacific Coast would be like more of a dark green, which you could totally do this in any color. You could totally do this in a dark green. Um, but just like the the mistiness of it and the trees. What about you? I mean, I feel like that too because I love that place as well. But, and this is a funny one. It reminds me of the show Vikings. Oh, yep. Kind of has that vibe. Yeah. Like a Scandinavian forest vibe. Totally. Okay, so now you can see that my paper is drying more and how you can tell is when I put in my next layer of values, it's not moving as much, okay? And that's okay, we're, we're at the spot where we want our paper to be a medium wetness instead of like soaking. And if you're like, well, my paper's not there yet, it's still really soaking. Well, that's okay, just keep kind of working around adding layers. And this is where I'm going to start to pay attention to, you see how like the hint of trees in between our really dark ones, like these light ones here, Yes. those marks, that's where I'm going to start like kind of paying attention to those areas and putting, putting stuff in between there. I love paintings like this because I got to think of a good name for them, but you essentially do 90% of the work and it's just an unintelligible painting. You would have no idea what this was if you're looking at it. And then like the last 10%, it just goes boom yep. and pops. Yes. I love that too, actually. And when I first painted this, it was a process of trust. Like I kept, cause I was just like, what am I doing? Like what marks am I even putting down on this? How can I, how am I going to be able to effectively teach this? And then I thought, trust the process, trust the process. Let's just see. 
let's just see how it goes, you know? It's kind of similar, you know, before you were Sarah Cray the teacher, you were Sarah Cray the pet portrait maker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember talking about you with this because you would do the eyes last. Mm -hmm. But like pet portraits do not really look like pets until they have eyeballs. Yes, they actually look really creepy (laughs) until they have eyeballs. (laughs) Similar vibe. Okay, and then now that I put in, I would say this is our more of a medium value. And I kind of bled all the steps together, right? Because it just depends on how your paper is drying and how much paint you're picking up. But just know we're basically just adding it layer by layer. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually switch to my six because I want to start to put in some of these trunks. And you can do all the trunks if you want like even the ones that are darker than what we're putting down now because we'll just be layering on top of them so it won't hurt. Basically, we put in so many like organic shapes like round that I need to start putting in more of the geometric and the twigs and the stuff like that to make it start to feel like trees. But our paper is still pretty wet, so when you put this in, it's still going to diffuse out, and that's okay. It's just like the start, you know? Alrighty, doesn't that seem so... Like, you can tell that something is happening. (laughs) I just keep thinking about, like, your brain and your eyes. It's interesting... How I'm assuming your brain processes things, which is you look for like a very, very solid detail, like a tree trunk, and then you process outwards that the leaves are there and stuff. You don't go the other way because if you did, you would go like, oh, this is trees, Mm -hmm. you know, from Mm -hmm. the shadows. But it's just weird. Human brains are nuts, man. They are. They're fascinating. And I love that so much of painting and creating art is just like creating illusions that's what we're doing right because like this is a two-dimensional flat surface so how do we take this two-dimensional flat surface and make it feel three-dimensional and learning the tricks to be able to do that is really what art is and it's what our eyes and brains do we're living in a three-dimensional world we can tell that there is depth and so then we have to pay attention to what qualities create this feeling of depth what qualities is it values is it colors is it line and basically trying to recreate those is what we're doing you know absolutely so as you can see my trunks bled out a little bit so we can just do another layer And I hope that you see this process as an opportunity to just like, how do I say this? This one, you can't really overwork. You know what I mean? Like every layer that you do adds to it. You just want to make sure you have the spaces in between of light. So you see if I, like just looking in this little corner, I have bare, I have like light, medium, more medium. You see the change in value just in this corner. So you just want to make sure that as long as you have that, you're good. And sometimes what I like to do now that I'm starting to put some marks in and they're staying a little bit, they're not my detail marks though. So I don't, really need them to stay as dark. Sometimes I'll take my one inch wash and just smear them. You can totally smear anything. If something is looking too sharp and you're like, no, 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 I want to push that back. I want to lighten it. I want to soften it. Just to smear works beautifully. It's interesting you say that about sharpening, unsharpening actually. Uh, If you don't know, I like to take pictures in my spare time, and it's counterintuitive to purposely try to take not as sharp as possible of a shot, but really, some of the most beautiful pictures are soft. Mm -hmm. 
And I think when you're painting, it's probably the same. You want to have like the most detail possible because you want it to look like a hyper realistic whatever. But like sometimes the softness is what's beautiful. Well, you need to have both, I feel. When when you have a clear well, okay, I guess it depends on what you're painting too, though, because like in landscapes, like what we're doing kind of right now, you need to have the soft and the out of focus with the harsh and the in focus and the sharp because the range is how we tell depth. But I do think that the two, when they're put together, complement each other. You know what I mean? Like they work together almost like darkness and light. You know what I mean? Like they're, they balance each other. So not only am I putting in my trunks with my six, I'm also going through and starting to put in some foliage. Again, this is still in our medium value range. We have crossed over to the medium. So look at your reference photo, look at your outline, try and think, okay, where do I see more of those medium values? And you don't want them, the other thing is you don't want them to cover up all of the previous values. Like, um, like our brain likes to make patterns, so it's easy for us to say, okay, I'm just going to keep layering on top in the same exact areas. Try not to do that because we need to let some of those previous values, those light ones, be seen. So I can, I'm putting color down, but I'm, I'm lifting up my brush too to let there be space in between. This looks like a... The development step in film when like the paper is starting to totally or like and a polaroid honestly like you could do a couple details on this and this could be a finished painting and actually be really cool yeah. you know what i mean yeah I'm going to try and cover up some of my pencil lines that I created when I did my outline. A little bit of pencil lines in a painting never bothers me, but sometimes if I feel like it's taking away, I'll purposely like mess up that line. And that is called Wabi Zabi? Mm -hmm. No, didn't you do a, what is that when you like, you make something imperfect on purpose? Well, wabi-sabi is the idea of finding appreciation in the imperfect and okay. the impermanent. I don't know if there's like a term for messing up a line. I watched a, a thing about this Japanese pottery maker. And in all of his pots, he would like dig his thumbnail into the edge of it. Cool. You know what I mean? Just yes. because like perfect is boring. Yeah. And I think that's why... And I hope for you guys that have been painting with me for a while, I have such a love for where I try and encourage you to go outside of what I'm doing. I'll show you what I'm doing, but like mixing your own colors, adding different things that I didn't add, just you putting your hand to this paper and creating something, it is going to and is supposed to be different than mine. That's the value and the beauty of it. We don't want carbon copies of the same thousand paintings. We want your version. We want, we want your ideas. We want your changes. And sometimes when we're first learning, we need to have a little bit more help. But know that if there's ever a moment while you're painting and your brain goes, hmm, I wonder what would happen if I did this. Even though I'm not doing it, do it. Do it. You have to do it because that is yourself coming out and saying, you can make decisions. You are a creative. You are an artist. And sometimes they pay off. Sometimes you're like, dang, I did that. And that looks great. And then other times you're like, that was a mistake. Don't love how that turned out. But it's all learning. So I hope that as you're painting this, if something kind of whispers to you to do something else, that you do it. It's scary, but it pays off in the end.
I love the Facebook group for this exact reason because, like, you and I will get chatting during a tutorial and say, like, this would be cool if you did it as a fall scene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, like, someone will grab onto that and do it and post it. And they're so cool. Yeah. Like, and I'm not a recreational painter. I don't really do this for, you know, in my spare time. I love watching you do it. But when I'm bored, I do go onto the watercolor Facebook group and just look at people's paintings because I think they're so cool. Yeah, it's so fun. Okay, and then I'm going to just kind of smear some stuff around because why not? I think as the case with some things, passion like bridges that gap of interest. You know, if you're passionate about something enough and you do it and you can, I don't know, you love your painting, it appeals to people who like might not even be into paintings. It transcends that gap sometimes. Yeah. I love it when you can look at a painting and tell that there was joy or like you could just tell the feeling when creating it. Sometimes I look at a painting and I can, I can say like, wow, I can tell I was really frustrated when I was painting <laughs> that. Or sometimes I can tell like, man, I was having so much fun when I was painting that. Okay. So now we're kind of getting to the part of our painting where our paper is starting to dry more, which means our colors are not blending out as much, but my paper is still damp. So this is good. This is where I'm going to start venturing into more the medium dark. Okay. I'm actually going to switch to my two. Well, let's make some more color before I do that. So I'm going to grab more Azure. I'm going to grab more blue. Now for me, when I added, um, like increase the values i just added more black you see how my my dark value is like a navy yeah. so i really embrace the black aspect but just know that when you're painting this using whatever colors if you wanted to do it using just blue you totally can it would just be like the pure blue would be your darkest value does that make sense yep okay and then i always like to do like a little test when i'm starting to like add more value of like how dark is that Actually, that that feels like one click. I kind of think of it as like a dial and I just want to add a value a click at a time. If I were to skip to pure black, that is not one click. That's a lot of clicks. Okay, and then I just blended that out. But what I did before, that felt like one click where I'm like, okay, yes, yes, this feels, this feels good. And now let's start to add maybe some more tree trunks and some branches. And I'm gonna switch my two because I'll get a thinner line. And I want you to also think about how these branches will kind of cross each other. So it's just kind of wisps, just the softest hint of there being more in between these leaves, in between the tree trunks. When you're getting into these darker clicks, as you call them, mm -hmm. um, is it starting to get too late to re-wet your paper because those will bleed? Um, no, let me show you. It will smear it and blend it out. Okay. But let's say you do an area that you just don't love or it's just drying too much that it's not blending it out. Rewet your paper. We are not ready for the stage where our paper should be dry. So if your paper is dry, just rewet wet it right now. And if you're picking up paint and you're just like, man, I just can't get a light enough color, just add water. Pull some of the paint to the side of your palette grab a scoop of water and mix that in, and then you'll have a lighter value. And then I'm gonna be doing the tree trunks again. And again, starting to put out some branches and some foliage. Okay. 
And if it's staying too sharp, smear it around. And as we're putting in this foliage, I think a scribble is a very valuable brush stroke. So sometimes I just take my brush and just kind of like smear up, down, like make inconsistent marks. And if you need to do some weird things with your hands in order to do that, that's fine. Or paint left-handed. Or paint left-handed. Let's try it. Or right-handed if you're left-handed. Whoa, this is so <laughs> hard. You should do a whole box about getting out of your comfort zone, paint every project other handed. I don't know if I could stand it. I'd be like, ah! <laughs> Just funny how, you know, being handed, right handed, left handed. You get so comfortable with things. Your other hand is literally exactly the same. It has the same functionality, capability. You just don't use it for anything, so you're not good at anything with it. Yeah. Actually, one of my high school teachers was ambidextrous. No way. Yeah, so he would write on the board, like on both sides, and just kind of like switch back and forth. And I'm like, oh, so cool. And then for a short time, I'm like, I'm going to be ambidextrous. <laughs> and then I tried it, and I'm like, nah. <laughs> nah. <laughs> Never mind. I'm too cool. <laughs> I've seen, I get recommended a couple like, you know, YouTube shorts or something where people will draw at the same time. Yeah, that's insane. Hands. I can't believe that. Yeah, that's so cool. Okay, so now, so basically we're at the stage where we're just being a little bit more aware of our marks. They're staying, I mean, they're not staying super sharp. They're still blending out a lot, but they're, um, because they're a little bit darker, they're easier to see. They're standing out a little bit more. Um, so this is where we wanna do like smaller marks here, the little details. And remember, not as sharp or as dark as our final layer. We're not, we're like, Still two more layers away from that, I would say. We're on click five or six. Yeah. Out of 10. Out of, who It knows? goes to 11. <laughs> if we just make up arbitrary numbers, <laughs> we're like, we're on click eight. They're like, what does that mean? <laughs> and it's logarithmic. It's not even linear, so the numbers don't matter. <laughs> I love this as a painting right now. Like, just finished. Yeah. There's something about it. It's kind of like eerie, but like beautiful eerie, ethereal. you know? Ethereal. Yeah, very ethereal. Like, I don't know. It also feels lonely to me. Huh, yeah, I get that. Like, um, like not like sad lonely, but like peaceful lonely, where you just have a moment to yourself to walk around and you're the only one that's kind of looking up at the sky and hearing the birds chirping and feeling the wetness on your skin and on the leaves and you just like stop for a moment and take it all in that that's what this painting feels like to me there's this alan watts quote it's really beautiful i don't know the whole thing but there's a part that says that like essentially you are the eyes by which the universe can see itself and so like i always think about that and you're doing you're doing a service to everything when you look at beautiful things. You're like, you're adding to the collective, you know, experience of everything by yeah. just looking at pretty stuff. Yeah. And not just looking at it, but like seeing it. There, You're stopping to see it and notice it. And I think that's a huge... I mean, as artists, I remember I took this um, this painting class and our teacher, who was a little eccentric, um, said the greatest gifts that artists have are their eyes because that is, that's how you can do it all. You know what I mean? Like if, if you can't stop and look and see what's actually there, if you can't notice how the light is shining and reflecting or how there's shadows along this or how color is popping through on this, like how are we supposed to recreate it? 
So it might feel like that painting is just putting, or making art is just like putting paintbrush to a paper, but I think it's so much more than that. I think when you stop and you look at the sunset and notice the colors, that's giving your brain information to create. That like so much of it is just stopping to see what is there in front of us. It just adds, you know? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm starting to do the more detail lines here. And remember, this is not my darkest value, but this is my medium value. And if sometimes, you know, like we're trying to do straight tree trunks here, but sometimes trees grow crooked too and wonky. So if you get a crook in your tree, there is totally, that probably is actually more realistic than a completely straight tree. So I don't want you guys to get frustrated. Okay. And you can switch back and forth between like your six and your two, depending on what you're painting, since this is like a thicker tree trunk there, then I can do my six. It looks like when you're sleeping in a tent and you have like the rain fly off and there's like kind of that mosquito netting above you mm -hmm. and you wake up and it's foggy and you still have the mosquito netting and you, so it's kind of like obscured a bit and you're looking at the trees. That's what this looks like right now. Yeah. I mean, when I painted this, it was scary, right? This is a new process for me, but also I found it like really satisfying. <laughs> like I loved that we basically just like wet our paper and then just like go. And then now at this point, we ha should have a few different values on our paper, right? And so if you ever you're just like, well, how do I know when I should stop? You know, that kind of thing for me. Or like, how do I know what area needs more attention or something like that? Is this is where I'm going to half close my eyes. I'm going to look at my paper. And on the bottom, I can see a lot of variation in value. Lots of lights and darks. Along the top, it's very even. So when my eye is half closed, this kind of melds into one value. That to me shows me that I don't have as much going on here value-wise as I do down here. And so whenever you're looking at your paper or your painting and thinking, is this area done? Half close your eyes. Do you have a bunch of different values in there? Or is it all evening out and bleeding together? If it's all bleeding together and you want there to be like differences, then you need to give that area a little bit more love. Now, I will say that like most of the value differences happens in the bottom half. The top half is not as extreme because it's more like the tops of the trees instead of like all the layers of the tree trunks, if that makes sense. But you can still have, you can still have it. Actually, I'm gonna switch my two for this. This is where we can start putting in the hint of branches. Remember, it's not our darkest value. And if you're like, well, where do these branches go? I've lost my outline. Just make, just make lines, just make thin lines. And sometimes branches are curved. Sometimes they're like jagged. That's a fun thought. Um, and this doesn't apply to all trees, but most trees are pretty much symmetrical. If you ripped them out of the ground and shook all the dirt off, the root structure kind of mimics mm -hmm. their top structure. So if it's a very tall, straight tree with, you know, like like this kind, like a conifer or something, mm -hmm. it probably has a, you know, large tap root that goes straight down to the ground and then has little branches. If it's like an oak type, it's got kind of a shallower root system mm -hmm. that kind of spreads out. I just think it's fascinating. That is fascinating. Yeah. Okay, so that's starting to look good. Now we're at the place where we are looking at pretty much like medium, medium dark, okay? 
So I want to make sure I have that. So basically I'm going to be picking up more paint on my brush and I'm going to test it. Yep, that's one click. That feels good. But we're not using pure black yet and this is still not our darkest dark. I say we're on uh, six or seven at now. <laughs> yes. 7.2. And because, so basically we're doing our medium, like medium, medium dark values. And we're trying to put in thin lines, but because they bleed out, like sometimes our line, our line is gonna get thicker when our paper is still wet because it's gonna bleed out. So knowing this, when I put in like smaller detailed lines, I'm gonna try and keep them as thin as possible, knowing that they will thicken on the wet paper. All right, I know what the scene is of. I know the official, what this scene is. Oh, you got it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You're a time traveler. Okay? okay. It's the future. You're running from a crime syndicate who's <laughs> doing something horrible. You're sprinting away. You're sprinting and you think time travel. And right as you do it, you sneeze a bit or something. And you get, sneeze. <laughs> you get like zooped to a prehistoric forest. Okay. Okay. Tan and rich forest. That's the blue color. Okay. And your eyes are opening and it's hazy because, of course, you just went through time dilation. Of and course. you're, you know, all wonky. Yeah. And right after this, you see a brontosaurus. Okay, yeah. I totally can get behind that. All right. That's the official for the record. <laughs> and the, the painting is called Pre-Brontosaurus. Pre-Brontosaurus. Or like the beginning of the end. That's some heady stuff you got going there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I'm switching. I basically am keeping my 6 and my 2 in my hand so I can switch back and forth pretty easily. This is where, and I'm actually going to be using like more of a dry brush technique for these detail lines on this, on these medium, medium dark. So I'm basically just kind of smearing my brush that is not super wet so I get these like inconsistent lines and then if they're still staying too sharp use your one inch and smear them out and I can I'm gonna say this out loud because I remember feeling this when I painted it the first time and I can and I'm feeling it now which is I really want to skip to the part where we put in the dark value. Like I'm just like, okay, we've been doing this for a long time, let's do it. And I remember telling myself, and I'm telling this now to you, don't skip to that part yet, trust me. Just, I know it's irritating having to do the same marks over and over again in slightly different values over and over again, but it's gonna be worth it. So like, I really want to just grab a dark value and put it in now, but I'm not going to. Not yet. It's about the journey. You got to be patient. You got to be patient. All right. Here's my uh, Facebook group request for this painting. Somebody out there. This middle prominent tree. It's got to be a brontosaurus neck looking down at you. <laughs> it's like, what is this hairless monkey that just <laughs> appeared in the forest? And if you can still see your outline clearly, you can go off of that. You can try and go off of the reference photo or you can just like start doing your own thing. You can add more trees if you want. You can, don't be afraid to go off script here. I've always just wanted outlines to be suggestions and a basic guide, not the only truth. Is that weird to say? You know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Also, trees and flora in general are so varied that, like, it'd be hard to make it not look like a forest at this point. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. 
when you're thinking of uh, trees, think about the bunches of leaves that grow kind of off branches and things like that. You know what I mean? Like kind of where it gathers. Smear that out. Makes more color here. Just remember that tree trunks get thicker as they go down. So whenever you're doing your trunks or your branches, they start out thick and then they thin out. And here I can tell that it's kind of evened out in value. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of like put in some, some variation in there, variation of mark making value. Kind of funny it just always until you add the dark values like right now it still just kind of feels like the ghost of a painting <laughs> you know yeah it will get there it will get there don't forget to smear And then here, where, where we've been focusing on like trunks and stuff, on this side, this is where we're going to focus more on like a branch and then kind of like sections of or groups of leaves coming off that branch. But again, we're not covering up the whole area. We really want to be able to see the all the delicious, lovely light values that we've already put down. So you're just putting some here and there. That was the other thing that was a little bit hard for me as I was painting this is I just wanted to put the marks in the same spot and instead you have to like look at it and be like, no, 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 I need to leave. You got to let the light in still. You got to leave some areas. Right. And notice that I'm still kind of using that dry brush texture and technique. And I'm kind of just, I'm, I'm not being like a leaf is an oval with points. Like I'm really just kind of making a bunch of different marks and smearing my brush around. I think in this instance, being that detailed would take away from the painting. Like well, if, if you had like a magnifying glass and we're painting leaves on here? I mean, it's it's hard to say because I don't paint like that normally. So I have like no experience with it. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, I don't know. Maybe it is better. I'm not sure. 
But what I do know is that really what we're fighting is our brain likes to tell us what things are, even though that's not what we're actually seeing. So a brain knows what a leaf looks like, but we don't see a leaf laying flat on the floor, which is what our brain tells us. We see leaves sideways and going away from us and going towards us, which totally changes its shape and like everything about it. And so that's why like I'm not going in here saying leaf, 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 because this is not a flat thing. This is in a world where there's so much movement around three-dimensional shapes. And so really the shapes that we see are thin lines and this weird curve and this funky thing, especially if we're doing silhouettes where they kind of layer on top of each other. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think now we're getting close to where we can put in like our dark, dark. I'm gonna do, I think I'm gonna do one more layer. Gosh, you can do so many layers on this. It could be never ending. It could be the never ending painting. Let's just see. Some areas if we were to put our darkest value, how does that look? Righteous. Mm, yeah, that's looking good. And just so you know, even on some of these <clears throat> trees that are kind of obviously farther away, you still can go in with this dark value and just do a couple details right on top. It's almost like um, the mist is going in and out around the trees. So some of them, like maybe the mist breaks up and you can see it more clearly and some of it, it's really covered still. So play with that. And then if, again, if you're putting in this kind of like dark value and it's still, it's like coming too far forward and you don't want it to go that far forward, take your one inch and just smear it out. And that will just like soften it and lighten it a bit. So it'll like push it back into space a little bit more. I just feel like this needs to be defined a little bit more. And remember, leaves grow in front of trees too, not just to the side of them. So go ahead and mess up your tree trunk by painting a group of leaves in front. And the other really lovely thing about this painting is let's say you put in like a dark detail line and you don't like it, take a damp brush and blend it out completely. It will not ruin your painting. Now, as we add more of the detail lines, we wanna make sure that our marks are smaller. Not on everything, but on some. Okay. And then we'll put some dark over here. And then, then we go in for the killer. We're almost there. So I'm just kind of still creating dashes and thin lines, playing with the angle of how I hold my brush.
Okay, let's put in our darkest dark now. You ready? Ready. Okay, so I have my six, more blue, more black. Try and get this to be the darkest color you are putting down. I'm not grabbing more water if I can help it because I want this to stay dark. And you also want to make sure that your painting is dry for this. So I'm not going to do the tree trunks yet. I'm actually going to work over here and put some of this in. So remember to still lift your brush even when you're putting in this foliage over here because there's still light in between. And then in the very center of it, like the closest to the corner of the paper, it's going to be more full. And then as it gets to the end here, that's what we'll do tiny little marks. So it just shows that it's more condensed in here and then it kind of thins out along the edge. And you can make those marks with your six. I like to do a little bit of both. So I'm going to do some with my six and then I'm going to switch to my two. Pick up that glorious dark value and do these tiny little ones. But remember, our brain loves to make patterns even right here. So try not to just do like an even spread of dots all around the edges. You know, sometimes smear your brush, sometimes let like more come out on one side like it's not perfectly circle you know what I mean mm -hmm. and remember not to cover up it's my I notice I did it on this side this side I'm specifically saying I'm not going to cover up all of the value that's underneath that I'm going to try and let some of it still be seen Okay, and I'm gonna work over here. This part is still just a little bit too damp that I don't wanna do my darkest value yet. So I'm gonna work on the parts where I know I'm just doing like little here and there. And even when it comes to these like branches, don't do continuous lines, just kind of touch it here and there. because we do want that feeling of it like going in and out of the mist and the fog. And isn't that interesting how just adding that dark value is like pops. It's like, dang, there it is. Yeah. The last 10%. The last 10%. Okay. Don't do any there. Okay. And then I just have like basically this big tree right here. And let's see. Let's see if it will bleed on me. Looks like it's staying. Let's go for it. So when you're putting your dark value in, you want to cover the trunk so it stays nice and dark. So that part you can like paint over the whole thing. But when it comes to like some of these, the foliage and stuff like that, you are not going to want to paint over the whole thing. You're just going to want to do a little here and there because you still want that gorgeous medium and light value to be noticeable. And it can overlap onto the other trees. And 
think about how not only does it go up, sometimes leaves go down. You know, branches kind of droop sometimes too. And sometimes if I don't like an area on a tree, I'll just cover it up with leaves. I think we're about there. And now this is a good time after you've put in your darkest values where you can look at the whole thing and say, okay, yes, there is a total range here. I feel really good about it. Or there are some areas where you're just like, actually, what if we just put like another layer of medium or something? Like now that you have an understanding of your full range of values, you can look at these different like specific areas and ask yourself like, does it need more or is that good? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think I might wanna like do a little bit more on these trees, but still keep the depth in mind. Keep, think about which ones you want to stay your darkest. And really, you can, you can play on this forever. This might be a good one where you kind of maybe leave on your desk for a bit and just kind of come back to it every once in a while, noticing some things and adjusting from there. I'm just going to kind of shape a little bit more. Okay, I think it's done. Isn't that fun? It's beautiful. I think my favorite aspect is actually when I look back in the softness right in that middle, like right here, I think is so lovely. I also feel like I've been staring at the painting so long that like I can only see in like ghost colors. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where I feel like my colors, my perception of my colors are off because I'm like, okay. I hope you had fun with this painting. I know that this was a different process and took us a little bit longer than usual, but um, I hope that it opens up opportunity for you where you say, oh, that's how you paint a really misty scene. Okay, how else can I do that? The biggest takeaways are look at your values. The values is what is going to communicate mist, depth, whatever you're trying to do, values that is key. Know that you can paint this in any color. This is, I mean, we stayed within like this desaturated blue, but you can do this in any color and it will turn out fabulous. And um, also think about mark making and how um, like we can utilize watercolor and the wetness of the paper to help us with diffusing and lightening our brush stroke to create that different values and to automatically create a fuzziness. That's what's beautiful about watercolor is just like if the paper is what you drop it in, it will automatically diffuse and create um, I don't want to say fuzziness again, but like it's not in focus and that can aid us in us creating a painting where there is some things in focus and some things out of focus. So I hope you had fun with this. I can't wait to see how yours turns out. Michael, thank you for being here. You're very welcome. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.